Coming up on the show this week, we check out the brand new SRAM NX budget 12-speed drivetrain. Danny Hart's got some new shoes. You guys keep sending in all this amazing stuff. And we check out a rather strange looking linkage single leg fork that's not made by Cannondale. Now let's take a look at SRAM's new NX transmission. So this is a budget 12-speed transmission that is far more affordable and sits in line with something like the Shimano SLX transmission. Of course, this is 12-speed and the way that they make it budget is by cunningly not using that 10 tooth that they've actually become famous for on their own dedicated Freehub XD driver body. So what they're using is the existing Shimano slotted design that's been around for a long time and providing you with an 1150. So it doesn't quite give you that 500% gear range gives you a 455 but it does mean you get 12 speed on a Shimano existing pattern block that's something that Shimano haven't even done so also as part of that NX transmission is a slightly redesigned chain ring on there they've got of course the 12 speed dedicated chain the type 3 clutch system on that rear derailleur and they've also got the dub system it's a new system but it will fit any existing bike because it comes with the bottom bracket that you specify Interestingly, it's the first 12-speed cassette from SRAM that is certified for e-bike use. So we do think we're going to start seeing this on a lot more e-bikes out there because although they do make an 8-speed e-bike cassette, we don't actually see many of them out there. We tend to see more regular 11-speed style transmissions out there. So 12-speed on e-bikes with a certified cassette, that's pretty cool. And the good news is the pricing. It's extremely good value for money. So where the GX group said it was already good value for money, about £495 uh, British stolen, that is, uh, you're actually looking for the NX group set at about £365. So it's substantially cheaper and it's supposed to be really, really durable. So this could be one of the best things to come out of SRAM for quite some time. And next up is quite a cool little gadget coming from AMS who make the frame protection kits. Now this is their crank boot. So on screen you can see now it's a rubber boot that goes over the end of your expensive cranks, be that alloy or carbon. Of course you're gonna get more use out of them on a carbon crank just because of the nature of what happens to them when you bash them hard on rocks. They're available in black, red, and green. They're really durable, really strong, and retail for just 17 euros. So that's an ideal thing if you've got long cranks, you've got a low bottom bracket, or you've just got carbon cranks, and you want to look after them. Nice little techie product, that. So next up is from Kona, and that is the new Hey Hey trail bike. Way back in the day, the Hey Hey was actually just a titanium hardtail frame basically it was like their cross-country frame and of course over the years it's merged into different bikes within the range as other bikes have actually replaced that like the Honzo sits in that range of trails or of hardtail now. Now the Hey Hey is 114 wheel travel front and rear it's running a 68 degree head angle so it's not the slackest bike it definitely points towards um, more of an XC trail riding sort of enthusiast. It's a very lightweight bike and it's 27 and a half inch wheels only and it uses a single pivot design with a linkage driving that shock and it's the fuse system out back which is Kona's take on offering flex between the seat stay and the chain stay to compensate for not having an additional pivot there. Have a look at this on screen, it's a very clean looking bike. Uh, it's made from 6061 aluminium and there's various different specs available on it. It looks like a really fun bike. I like the fact they're not going too crazy with slack angles on this bike because it's definitely just more of a, a fun, lightweight trail bike that's going to have that nice agile feel. Sometimes, as much as I love a slack head angle bike, they can just be a little bit too much of a handful for your daily ride. So it looks like a nice bike, that from Kona. Now it looks like Team Canyon have been doing some testing. Now we spotted these pictures actually over on Vital MTB, but they're also floating around on Instagram and a few other places of what looks like a slightly different or a modified version of the sender. Now it looks to me like there's slightly different linkage housed in that seat stay sort of junction box there. Check it out, it looks like there's something very cool coming from Canyon, so we're gonna keep our eyes peeled for this one. Now it looks like Danny Hart might have a signature shoe coming from Shimano, judging by this picture that we've spotted having a little trawl through Instagram. Now it looks very similar to the AM9, which is their downhill SPD compatible shoe, and of course Danny does like to race clipped in, so it does suit him very much. It's got protective lace cover over there, it's got really grippy sole. In this case, it's a gum sole, so it looks really cool. Almost like a bit of a skate shoe against that black upper on there. And then if you look at the heel cup design, it says Danny Hart all over it. Got his name on a pair of shoes, they look pretty fancy to me. Now recently we've been looking at some really odd suspension designs out there. So in particular, Cannondale's new lefty fork, the Ocho. So that's a single crown lefty fork, and of course, 
A lot of people, well, it's a typical Cannondale product is very much Marmite, love and hate sort of thing. Personally, I'm a lover and I know a lot of you guys didn't like it, but that's cool, you know, each to their own. But if you didn't like that, then you're definitely not gonna like this. This is the new Adroit Linkage Fork. Have a look at that. Not only the new Adroit Linkage Fork, but this is their new linkage single leg version of that fork. So you're hitting two things in one hit here. Instantly, the first thing you're gonna see against the lefty is the fact that it's got a linkage design. It's not a telescopic fork, so it's not a more conventional suspension fork. Now, this particular fork, the Adroit, is very different. It uses any bicycle shock on the market that's compatible with it. It comes with a Fox X2 200 by 57 on there, and that offers 160 millimeters of travel, and it's a stiction-free travel as well, or so they say. So it's got a nearly vertical axle path on there. It's made from carbon fiber. It's got an integrated 32 millimeter stem and it's compatible with all 200 by 57 or 200 by 50 rear shocks. Now, something else that's interesting about it is it's boost compatible and it uses conventional mountain bike wheels on the front. So you don't have to change your hub for like a lefty design hub. So on the lefty, you basically have your axle, the hub slots onto it, and then you have a cap on the end that screws into the axle. On this particular design, it uses existing hubs. You don't have to have anything different and it's got very cool sprung cap on the end there to retain that wheel. I mean, say what you want, it's a pretty intricate piece of design and I bet it does work quite well actually. But of course, visually, you may not like this thing. Now also from Adroit Cycles, they've got some pretty radical looking hardtails with really progressive geometry. So on screen now is the substrate. So that comes in a few different options for starters. So you can get steel options like stainless steel, you can get air hardened steel, and there's also a titanium version. So my money would be on a titanium version because there's something really special about that metal. Now the geometry on this 27.5 plus bike is pretty radical as well. So out back you've got four 18 mil chainstays on the large and the XL, and on the small and the medium, they've got three nine eight mil chainstays. So it's good that they keep this in relation to the body size and the person riding it. Now reach on the XL is super long, it's 520 millimeters. So that's five mil longer than on the XL Nuke Proof Mega, which is one of the longest sort of stock bikes, not including things like the Pole or the Nikolai bikes out there. So even the other sizes are pretty long. So you've got 450, 470, and 490 mil for small, medium, and large, respectively. And it's got a 64 and a half degree head angle out front. So that's pretty radical as well. I think it's just a really cool looking bike. And it has got a slightly strange down tube design. So you can see how the down tube actually is almost scooped out until it starts there. And the reason for that is to make it compatible with their linkage fork. Now that linkage fork, something I didn't mention above is because of the design of the fork, it's incredibly close to the down tube. However, they say if you can fit a Bluto, so that's a RockShox fat fork, or a Fox 36 in your frame, you should be able to fit that fork, if it takes your fancy, of course. And finally, this is a bit of a retro one, and this one really pleases me. So Paul's Components, they were one of the original sort of CNC machined manufacturers of brake levers, like the Love Lever. They also made a rear derailleur back in the day. In fact, that's a derailleur on the screen right now, and that's the raster colored one. That was the coolest thing ever, that thing. And it must have cost a fortune back then. I can't remember, I just always used to want one. Anyhow, they're doing reruns now in anodized purple, including all of that retro stuff, like the Love Levers, but also some of their new things, like the cable operated disc calendar. Man, just look at this stuff. It is just rude. Really, really like that stuff. If I'm going to do sort of a modern retro build, I think I'm going to have to have some sort of pulls components on there at some point. Maybe that's a project down the line. All right, now it's time for Bike Cave, which of course is one of my favorite sections of the show, where we get to check out all of your bike caves at home. What is a bike cave? A bike cave is where you keep your bikes, where you work and tinker with your bikes. Could be the back of a van that you've turned into a bit of a workshop. Could be a garden shed. Could be a front room, could be under your bed. Whatever it is, we want to see it. Send them in. The address is on the screen and please use the hashtag bike cave. Nice and simple. So first up this week is from Andrew Demoline. Here's a shot of my updated bench at my home-based bike service shop, the Cove Bike Shop Limited. Let's have a look at this bab. Whoa, hello. Oh man, that is nice. Oh, look at that. So you've got Husky units in there, three of them. Got a real nice worktop on there. So you've got a park stand, like a bench mounted one. They're quite cool actually. I did consider getting one of those. I mean, I've ended up getting a full size 
um, work stand so I can just move it around in my workshop. I'm actually going to fit coaster wheels onto it. So it's got a big stainless steel plate, but I did consider the workbench one, but just with the design of my particular workshop, it means if I've got a bike in the stand and it's mounted on the workbench, I won't be able to get access to it. So, but I love the way you've done yours. And I also like the fact that you've got, you've got a tool board at the back, but it's not inundated with tools. Like I like how neat and tidy your place looks. Like I love our workshop because it's got all the tools and you can see what you get all the time, but at home, that's not the setup that I want. I think I think yours looks a lot more similar to what I would have. That is seriously nice. Really nice units as well there. Eh? I mean, that's good enough to turn it into a kitchen, I reckon. That is pretty mint. Nice one. So that is um, the Cove Bike Shop Limited. So very nice. Make sure you uh, get in touch with those guys if you need your bike fixing. Next up is from Hayden Davis. I've got a bike cave picture for you. Um, which is running out of space. I keep my Nikolai G13 hung up warm inside of the house. I've got a nice tall wall which is just out of shot. Nearly every tool for all situations and ages of bikes. Uh, just some tools. In recent addition is a parts washer. Yes, I need to buy one of those. Um, got my eye on one of those at Screwfix actually. Uh, for quickly shining up lots of parts at once. Also a GT LTS frame which I want to polish and restore. Yes, and that is also Yeti SB 4.5C hiding in that box. Well, Hayden, let's have a look at this stuff then. Oh, dude, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. Okay, so yeah, there's your box with a Yeti hidden away in there. Nice trusty park blue work stand. Nice park blue uh, tool jig there as well. Tool jig, wheel jig, can't even speak at the moment. Nice vice as well, big GT sticker, exposure lights on the side there. Guessing you like your night riding if you've got exposure lights because those things are pretty flipping bright. I like your bike hooks on the wall there actually, they look quite good. I'm in the market for some of those. In fact, if anyone's got any good ideas for ones that I should buy myself to put in my workshop at home, I'm looking to house probably up to about eight bikes, hang them vertically, so by the front wheel. I'm gonna have a strip of checker plate along the bottom so my paintwork doesn't get damaged by like mud and stuff like that. But at the top, I need some decent hooks. I'd quite like ones I could turn sideways if possible so I can get the bikes closer together and rack them over. But those ones look quite good. Let us know what they are if you if you uh, watch this. I see got Moby washer down there as well. They're pretty damn good. Good to fill up water, keep in the boot of your car and you can run them off the cigarette lighter charger, sock it in, the, in your cars. Nice, that's good work, Hayden. Crammed little bike cave you got yourself there. Next up is from Graham McKenzie. Got no details with this one other than the picture, but man, when a picture speaks a thousand words, this is a rude bike cave. Man, look at that. So you've got your canyon up on the back wheel there. Oh, that's a different way of hanging a bike up vertically. That's nice, doing it from the bar side. That's pretty cool, I might have to look at those as well. Nice troily lid up there next to your pock helmet as well. Spirit levels and all sorts of woodworking tools on the back there. Man, it's a lovely looking building as well. Is that a specially built bike cave or is that part of your house? It's kind of hard to tell. It almost looks too good to be a bike cave. That is lush. Kind of looks a bit like a sauna in a kind of cool way. I like the flooring as well. Good detail, park work stand, sort of the regular. And of course you've got Yeti in there. So, I mean, if this was a bike vault entry, you would probably get super nice just on principle. Although well, you have got a road bike down there, so it might be sort of negative points there, but uh, no, just joking. Everyone's got to have a good road bike for a bit of training. Good to see you've got some WD-40 down there and alongside some SRAM butter as well for your forks. So that tells me that you are really into fettling on your bikes. Love it. Really, really nice, Graham. Would it be nice to have some details to know where you're from and stuff, Graham? So if you see this, comment in the comments below. We'd just like to know that because you've got an awesome looking bike cave there. And last one in bike cave this week is from Edward Frisbee. I have a submission for bike cave. This is my dad's shed for all things bikes. Whoa, dude, you've got a lot of pictures here. And there's a lot of bikes in there. That looks more like a bike shop than a bike cave. Oh, you've got one of those Stanley sort of t wheelie tool things, like a caddy, they're cool. Plenty of road bikes in as well. So it's got a good variety of stuff. You're really proper cycling family by the looks of this. A lot of bikes, I like the uh, the bike rack that you've made there, just from, just from wood. It looks simple, nice. Yeah, plenty of tools and a little cupboard as well to keep them clean and out of the way. Like it, and then you've got a nice wall hanging there. Ah, that's why you're trying to make it soundproofed a bit. So you've got your guitars in there. Oh, that's a proper little man cave, love it. Oh, there we go, that's all of the pictures. Thank you, Edward, for sending those pictures in of your dad's bike cave. And it certainly looks like he's got a pretty damn good one. See you next week. All right, now it's time for Rewind, which of course 
we rewind it back to all those retro bikes and retro goodness. So whether you've got questions on random retro goods like these Onza brakes or this Gervin Flex Stem from back in the day, let me know if you have and I'll be happy to try and tell you about some of that cool stuff, where it came from and the products you're likely to have seen them morph into these days. But more importantly, I love seeing retro stuff from you guys. So anyone that's got anything retro, whether it be whole bikes or just components, take some pictures and send them in to us. Use the hashtag rewind. I know a lot of you are using hashtag retro. You can use that as well, but rather rewind. It does make it easier for me to find them all because uh, we do get a hell of a lot of emails these days. You'd be quite surprised. So first up this week is from Luca Smith. Hi from the Colombias, uh, sorry, south of France there. Here are some pictures of my mum's old Navarro Team SL of the early 90s. Oh yes, okay. Uh, it's a chrome molly frame, Tang Ultimate Superlight MTB tubing. Uh, it's equipped with Shimano DRXT, an LX crankset and SLR Plus brakes. It also has some Mavic wheels on there. What will probably please you more is the 1993 25-year-old RockShox RS Mag 21. Yes. Um, my friend recently serviced it, so it still works. Right, let's have a look. Oh, there's a little peep at that Mag 21. We'll get there in a minute. LX brake levers. Of course, the rapid fires under the, under the bars there. Oh, and there is that Mag 21. Look at that, there's a fork. So the Mag 21 took on the same shape, basically, from the RockShox RS1. The Mag 21 was the next iteration of it. it. had magnesium lowers on there. It had a slightly refined brake arch on there, so it's a bit stiffer, but the internals were substantially better than those earlier RS1s. Some of those early forks and rocks actually were very good. Had the Magnesium M logo down the bottom there, which is kind of cool, and you start to see a lot of those colours be, be brought back into the sort of RockShox range. I know I've seen some uh, slip-on vans by RockShox floating around the world. I'll cut some things off to have some of those, if uh, anyone from RockShox is listening. Next up is from Mason Gallagher. Saw this Cannondale about a year ago at my school. I loved the carbon chain stay and thought I'd send it in. Um, that is a, wow, that's a Cannondale Super V1000. So the year after, so this mm, 95, I'm gonna say that bike is, because I think the year after they changed the back end design, it actually ended up with a lower pivot and they called them the Super V Active. Um, well, I think we had one of those last week in Rewind. This particular one's got Magura HS22s on there. Uh, the red ones, of course, the 33s with a luminous yellow race line model. We've got spin wheels, front and rear, Fox Alps shock. Man, that is a seriously cool bike. In fact, um, I do know for a fact I've got some Cannondale old school catalogues here on my computer, and I'm just going to get them up on screen now so you can see them. And there we go, that is what that model is the Super V with the HCV 440 carbon fiber swing arm. Look at that bad boy. So it is an award winning frame that weighed just 750 grams back then. So, um, Oh, that's the back end, that is not the entire frame. So, so it's a bit scandalously light, if that's the case. It's got the head shock unit up the front there, so that is where Cannondale housed the shock absorber unit inside the head tube of the frame, and it used a regular rigid fork at the bottom. So of course, steering and tracking, everything was phenomenal, just like a rigid fork, but you had the forgiveness of the suspension. The only downside was it did make for quite a high front end, so quite often it'd have negative rise stems. In this case, there isn't one on there, but you could flip that upside down and there's a dial on the top for the uh, lockout. But man, look at that. I still think that's one of the nicest looking designs that Canada have done over the years. It was quite radical at the time with that sort of flying V sort of shape to it, and that really nice sculpted back end. I definitely got it, Cannondale. They've got that thing. I reckon, I reckon they're up there with Yeti and the thing in their old days, anyway. Oh, nice. Oh, no more rewinds. That's it for this week. Thanks guys for sending them in. Keep them coming, love that stuff. All right, now we're in the realm of modification on your bike. So this is Top Mods. It's where you guys and girls get to send in pictures of your bikes that have been modified by yourselves. Could be handlebar grips, could be bar ends, could be tires, could be a whole new front end of the bike. Whatever it is that you've done to your bikes, let us know about it. We love seeing people upgrade their bikes themselves. It's really satisfying. It's a really cool thing to do. So first up is from Hayden Davis. Hey Dolly, loving the show. I've got a hack for the winter months. Oh man, are we talking about winter already? I feel like we've only just got to summer. Don't get me wrong, I like riding in the mud, but I'd much rather ride in the dry, warm temperature that we have at the moment. Uh, anyway, I'm sure people do this already. I've got some lizard skin fork boots. 
and use them to cover up two of my Fox Transfer dropper posts. Hopefully this will keep the seals cleaner and service times extended. Yeah, no, that is a very good idea, Hayden. Of course, it does keep the mud and stuff away from them, but just bear in mind that neoprene like that can soak that stuff up and actually hold it on the stanchion tube. So after a ride, when you've got wet and muddy on that bike, you do want to make sure that you give them, take that off again, give it a clean and then put it back on, because otherwise you're going to be grinding the sort of like the grit against from the material against the stanchion tube of that. But to keep the mud away from the seal in the first place, it's a really, really good hack. Yeah, I'm really into that. Oh, I can see a silverfish sticker in the background. I like those guys, they're based, based down in uh, Plymouth. Got some cool retro bikes. In fact, you're going to see some very cool retro bikes coming up in the next couple of shows, courtesy of those guys, actually. The owner of that company has got a serious retro fetish. He's got, the amount of retro bikes he's got is quite phenomenal. Nice to see. Oh, the little video as well. Love it. Roop. Nice one. That is awesome. Okay. Next up is from Alistair's son. Hi Doddy and GMBN team. Loving the show, especially Rewind. Good man. Uh, I recently bought this Kingdom Bikes Vendetta uh, times two off a friend. Kingdom Bikes are very nice. Uh, he built it up with an 11 speed SLX drivetrain and brakes, a RockShox Pike up front, but he makes frame bags so he included one with it as well. I got it with a Thompson Elite C post, but after a couple of rides realized the dropper uh, was well in order. Initially, I didn't think I was going to be able to run a 150mm dropper since the shortest ones out there were still a few millimetres too tall. That's a really good point, actually, that someone needs to consider when you're buying a dropper seat post is the minimum height it can be to offer the maximum drop. So it does affect that with frame sizing. Um, however, when 1UP released their dropper at Sea Otter with its super low stack height, um, I ordered one immediately. It just fits in the collar all the way down, so it's completely slammed and using the whole drop there. Uh, so it works out perfectly. Yeah, that looks really, really cool. And that's, oh man, you're literally like within a millimeter. That is a perfect fit. How cool does that look? It looks like it's almost integrated. And a bike bag, do you know what? I really like the whole look of that bike. Everything about it looks great. The angles look good. Uh, the quality of that frame, the welding, beautiful. I really like the frame bag. The way it fits that. Hmm. Giving me ideas. Like it. Cool, right, there we go. So that is enough top mods. Actually, I lied. I wanted to show you a top mod I made to my own bike. After having seen a little modification that Loris Verger's mechanic made to his chainstay of his bike, with his little fins of rubber. Yeah, so I thought that was a really good idea because on my Scott, I've got a 32 tooth chainring with a, a Eagle setup out the back. And on some of my local trails that are extremely rough, like rooty, rocky single track, when I'm going max speed on those trails, I'm actually at the smaller end of the cassette, so the chain is quite loose. And even though the Scott bikes come with a really good rubber chainstay protector, you're still hearing the chain slapping on that chainstay. So I've got some out of 3M mastic tape. I didn't quite have enough to make a full length chainstay protector, but I did try just making the three fins and it works amazingly. It's so quiet now with that, but it does look a little bit messy. So I've ordered some more of that 3M tape. I'm actually gonna make a better version. I've got an idea how to make it a lot neater looking and actually something a bit more along the lines of what the Specialized has, like this one, on their chain stay. So I think they've obviously had that idea in the first place of just working out where the chain slap. And just by fitting these fins, I've actually seen the points that the chain does contact them. So you can just refine it a bit more. So it's gonna be a better mod coming up soon. But also in the picture, you can see I've run a very thin layer around the inside of the upper chain guide because although the chain it doesn't come off the chain rim because it's a narrow wide, under compression when the chain is rattling around, the, the chain can hit the top. It doesn't hit the side plates. Like it's basically this sort of profile and I've put the rubber on the top here because sometimes the back of the chain can hit the top of that chain guide and just make a slight rattle. Not much, but it's enough to sort of niggle at me when everything else is almost silent on the bike. So, love a silent bike. So that is my little top mod. What do you think of that? So tech of the week this week is actually a bit of retro tech. So I know we've already had the rewind section of the show, but this is pretty cool. So I've just come back from a bike event called the Malvern Hills Classic. Now this is one of the first events I ever rode. I did it in 1991, two, three, and four. And I think the event went on to 1998 before it was it sort of just phased out. And now it's back again. It's a big festival in the UK and there's a lot of retro sort of basis there. 
and I was checking out some very cool bikes. And in particular, look on screen now. And this is a Specialized Stump Jumper FSR. And this belonged to a legendary British racer who is no longer with us. This is Jason McCroy's bike. This particular one is the one he raced at the Kamikaze downhill on Mammoth Mountain. It's got an enormous 56 tooth chain ring on the front here. Just look how big that thing is. And it's got a dedicated AC chain guide on there. So much retro tech is amazing, but what I really want to talk about is the fact it's a simple four bar system on there. And it was pretty much off the back of this bike that Specialized licensed that FSR technology. So they basically, they owned it and they had to license it to other bike brands in order to use that. And it was quite common at the time for other brands to be using it because it was a simple system that worked very effectively. Like the GT LTS used a very similar system. And in fact, the layout looked very similar as well. And of course, later in the late 90s, the LTS design was phased out. Now, it could be a coincidence of the FSR design, or it could be the fact that they just designed their, their newer iDrive style system. But anyway, back on this, on this JMC bike here. So JMC was like an enormous figurehead for mountain biking in the UK. I mean, and this particular bike was stunning, but after looking at this bike, which of course was his Kamikaze bike, just taking you through that, I went over to see the guys at Retro Bike, and the collection of bikes they had was overwhelming. They just had so much cool stuff there, and they had two of Jason's other bikes. So they had his regular trail bike, which he also used for downhill racing, and they had his famous slalom bike. Now, a slalom bike, if you look on screen now, pretty sure it was a size 14 inch, and it was a Stump Jumper M2 team. Um, it was just a cross country frame, but he got it deliberately in size small, so it looked like, well, he rode more like a BMX. And of course, Jason, as we know, had a BMX background. It was really reflective in the way that he rode a bike. Now that bike, at a glance, look at his profile, it doesn't look too dissimilar to modern jump bikes. And it's certainly one of the best looking bikes I've, I've ever seen, I think, even now. I mean, it's got a triple chain ring on there. It's got an XTR transmission. Of course, you don't need all those chain rings up front these days with one by. It's got a chain guide on there. That's Dave's chain device, made by the same guy that made the crud catcher on there. That's a, um, by Pete Tompkins. The pedals are Odyssey triple traps, three inch rise, a Zonic bars, a Zonic shorty stem, grip shift x-rays. Um, they are Onza Porky Paw grips, Avid brake levers on there with Avid brakes as well. And of course it's got those famous duties that the specialized only ones made of carbon. So they're the FSX forks, absolutely stunning bit of kit. Now let's just take a quick look at the other bike as well, which of course is his Stumpy FSR, again with that four bar linkage. Man, just look at this thing, just absolutely stunning, like SUP rims on there, specialized tires, again, XTR, all over the thing. And just when I thought I couldn't see any more JMC related bikes, when I took those bikes I just photoed back to the retro bike stand, there was another model there, but actually this one was a replica. So one of the retro bike members had got a 16 inch frame rather than the 14 and built up from the ground up an exact replica. I mean, there's a few little minor details that it just had, it hadn't been possible to source on there. So for example, the tires, he's got Panorasia Smoke and Dark Classics on there. They're still amber wall and it's still very similar tread pattern to what Jason used to run. Of course, he had the specialized tires on there, but not quite original, but there you go. Like it looks incredible and so alike. Like the chainstay protector on it is a finish line one. And the guy that owned this particular bike had, had this made up especially to look identical to Jason's one and even measured the position of the DCD on the chainstay there. I mean, it's just, it's mind blowing the level of detail that people are going to with these builds. So there we go, there's another weekly GMBN tech show in the bag. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the ride. Um, for a couple more great videos, click down here if you wanna see the Chainless Suspension Geek Edition, which is done by Neil. So this is quite a cool video in which we basically helped Neil make like a little free coaster, if you like, for his cassette, so the chain would pass over it to try and isolate the chain from making the suspension work. So it's all about his discoveries and other systems that have done similar stuff to that. So check that one out down there for the Pure Geek Edition and click up top if you'll know everything about how to pack your bike and take it away on holiday. So that's everything from what you need to take off your bike, things you need to factor in like not taking CO2 on planes, all the way to putting it in the bag. So that is a great video, especially at this time of year when everyone is going on holiday. As always, click on the round globe to subscribe to GMBN Tech if you've not done that already. And if you like GMBN Tech, give us a thumbs up.